Okay, here's part two of the lectures on Ampere's Law for chapter 28. Essentially, at this point, we just start to apply Ampere's Law for various situations. So go ahead and start to access the lecture examples in today's folder. Go ahead and copy down the first of those examples. Let me go ahead and read it to you. So you have two parallel wires that are separated by a distance D. The currents in the respective wires are I1 and I2. Those currents are caused by different batteries, so it's basically just two circuits that are close to each other. This then means that each current carrying wire is going to create a magnetic field, and then therefore each current carrying wire is going to exert a force on the other. So find the force per length that each wire exerts upon the other when the currents are pointing in the same direction. All right, so ultimately the situation looks like this. So we have right here a current I1, and then that current is caused by a battery over here somewhere, for example. And then we have a separate current like so. I2 pointing in the same direction, and it's parallel to the first wire. This guy here is caused by a battery, say, over here, off in that direction. Okay, and then the two or the two wires, excuse me, are separated by a distance here that's referred to as D. So find the force per unit length that each wire exerts upon the other. So we're going to do an F equals IL cross B type of calculation here. We have to find, however, the B field that each wire causes. And then ultimately, when we do calculate out the force, then we'll just divide out by the length L to get the force per unit length. So that's the basic idea. All right, so let's take a look at the force on 2 due to 1. Let me write that like this. The force on 2 due to 1. Okay, well, in other words, number 1 is going to cause a magnetic field that is then going to exert a force upon I2. So the right-hand side of the expression is going to be the current I2 times its length, we'll eventually divide out by the length, and then we're going to do the cross product here with the B field associated with current number one. So current number one creates a magnetic field that then exerts a force on current number two. So this is the force on two due to one, like so. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take a look here at I1. We need to write its magnetic field at this point right here. We'll use Ampere's law to do so. So here's Ampere's law once again. And then here's how we apply Ampere's law for this situation. So for current I1, I'm going to take the thumb in my right hand and point it in the direction of that current. And then therefore the direction of my fingers here curl on my right hand side represents the direction of the magnetic field. So right over here at the location of I2, this guy's magnetic field is going to point into the board. And then we'll go ahead and just set up a circular Ampere path like in part one's lecture, in order to find that magnetic field. So let me go ahead and draw the path itself like so. Let me go ahead and draw the B field. Like this. Let me make the circle here a little bit more symmetrical. All right, here's the center of that circle. The radius of the circle here is the distance D, and then the magnetic field here, B1, it circulates in this direction, so it's like so. So over here on the right-hand side, the direction of that magnetic field, B1, is into the page. Okay, now let's find its magnitude by applying here in Ampere's Law. So on the left-hand side, our path integral, our line integral, is just going to be B1 times 2 pi D. Remember that the radius of the circle here is the distance D. And this then equals on the right-hand side of the expression mu naught times I enclosed, where I enclosed here is just I1. It's I enclosed, enclosed by my Ampere path as I make this circle around I1. All right, so divide the 2 pi D here to the other side. So, and there is then, therefore, the magnetic field's magnitude that is caused by current I1. Okay, now getting back to our cross product over here, let's go ahead and do right-hand rule on the right-hand side of the expression to get the direction of the force vector that's exerted here upon wire number two. Okay, so I have then, therefore, I2L in this direction cross B1 into the page, then gives us a force vector like so. So right here is the direction of the force vector on two due to one. Okay, there is a 90 degree angle here for simplicity between I2L in this direction and B1 like so. So then therefore the magnitude of this force vector is just going to be this, like so. Okay, let's go ahead and divide out by the length and then plug in for B1 this quantity here. Alright, so the force per length, remember that's what's being asked for here, 
is now going to be B1 times I2, like so. And then we divide it out by the length already. All right, so this expression right here is the force per length that is exerted upon current number two due to current number one. And now we do it backwards. Now we find the force on one due to two. In other words, number two causes its own magnetic field, and that magnetic field then exerts a force here on this current. It should, in magnitude, be the exact same thing as this, but it should be in the opposite direction. That's, of course, Newton's third law. So think of this as the action, therefore the reaction should have the same magnitude and be in the opposite direction. All right, let me go ahead and draw this out here on the lower board and illustrate. All right, so here's I1. Here's I2, and now here's the expression we're gonna find. We're gonna find the force on one due to two, and then therefore this is gonna equal current number one, I1, there we go. I1 multiplied by length L, and then we'll take our cross product here with the magnetic field that is caused by current number two. So current number two creates its own magnetic field right here at this location. That is then going to exert a force on this current carrying wire. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the magnetic field calculation by setting up Ampere's law. Once again, here's Ampere's law in general, and then here's what we're asked to find. All right, so I'm gonna take my thumb here and point it in the direction of I2, and then therefore I2's magnetic field circulates like this. However, notice that over here on the left-hand side of the diagram that I2's magnetic field B2 is gonna come out of the page, it's gonna come out of the board like so. Okay, let me go ahead and draw my Ampere'an path here as a circle once again. Like so, here's the center of that circle, and then magnetic field number two circulates in this direction from right-hand rule. But right over here at this location, it's gonna be coming out of the page at us, like so. Okay, once again, the distance D here is the radius of the circle. That's the separation between the wires. Okay, now to find the magnitude of that magnetic field, we're gonna have here B2, and then multiply by two pi D, that's the circumference of the circle. This then equals U naught I2. I2 is the I enclosed, and then just divide by 2 pi D. Like so. Okay, and now let's go ahead and do our cross product here. In this case, we have I1L pointing upwards on the board, like so, but then we cross it with B2 in this direction, like so. That then gives us a force vector in that direction. So this is the force on one due to two. So no, notice that, yes, that force vector, the reaction, if you will, is in the opposite direction of the action force vector on the top board from the force on two due to one. It should have now have the same magnitude. Okay, then from right-hand rule and doing the cross product here, there is a 90 degree angle between I1L and the B field number two, sine of 90 is equal to one, so then therefore the magnitude of this force vector is just nothing more than the following. And then we just divide out by the length like so, and then replace the B2 with that expression there. All right, so then therefore the force on one due to two is equal to this. Once you do the math, and of course it's the exact same thing as up on the top board, okay? Okay, so if you've got two current carrying wires where the currents are pointing in the same direction, ultimately what then happens is that the forces are such that the two wires attract each other like this. A variant of this problem is to have the two currents anti-parallel. In other words, one current pointing in one direction and the other current pointing in the opposite direction like so. It's basically the exact same sort of problem, the exact same sort of calculations. However, what you would find in that example is that the two current carrying wires would repel each other like so. Okay. okay, that's number one. I'm going to go ahead and erase the board here and manipulate my file here to number two. Go ahead and pause and copy down question number two into your notes.
Okay, and number two, we have a uniform cylindrical distribution of current. In other words, it's a wire with thickness. Okay, the total current is I and the radius of the wire is capital R. Find the magnetic field everywhere. Okay, so we draw out this scenario in the following way. Okay, here's the current carrying wire like so. We'll say by definition that the current points out of the page. Like so in this direction and then right here is the radius capital R. So what we're going to set up here very simply is a circular Ampereian path once again for this situation. The circle will basically circulate on the diagram like so when we set up the integral. Let's go ahead and calculate the magnitude of the magnetic field for the easy portion of this calculation. And that's when the radius of our circular Ampereian path is greater than capital R. So let's set up this scenario here first. Okay, so once again, there's Ampere's law. And on the left-hand side of the expression, like you've already seen thus far in each of my calculations, this right here is just going to be B times 2 pi r. So we're going to end up then with a magnetic field here outside of the wire that circulates around the wire like so, where here is its direction. So the direction, once again, is from right-hand rule. My thumb is pointing in the direction of the conventional current, and then my fingers in my right hand circulate on the diagram here counterclockwise. So we end up with these magnetic field lines like so. They're concentric and centered here on the center of the wire. Okay, the right-hand side of the expression is just mu naught times the total amount of I. That's the total amount of I here that's enclosed within our Ampereian path. And then therefore, when we divide by 2 pi r, we we'll once again end up with this expression here, as we've already seen. However, now let's go inside the wire. When we go inside the wire, we have to come up with I enclosed. Recall when we did this for Gauss's law with electrical charges, it involved density. Same thing here. Specifically, it's going to involve current density J from chapter 25. Recall that current density J is equal to current per area. So we need to set up those types of calculations here to get the I enclosed. All right, so then therefore, let's now go inside the wire. Like so. I'm just going to redraw it here. So here's our total I coming out of the page like so. And now right here is going to be our circular Ampereian path centered here on the center of the wire. Once again, by the way, from right hand rule, the magnetic field is going to circulate here counterclockwise on a diagram. So right here is B. Okay, so then setting up Ampere's law for this situation. Okay, the right hand side of the expression is the same thing as it was on the top board here because the 2 pi little r there, that corresponds to the circumference of our Ampereian path. So right here in blue, for example, is the radius of that Ampereian path little r, and it's less than capital R, like so, the radius of the wire. But how do you get the I enclosed on the right hand side of the expression? As I said, this is where density comes into play, current density J, which is current per area. So right over here on the right-hand board, let's write now current density J in the following way. Let's write it first of all in terms of the total current. So it would be the total current divided by the total cross-sectional area of the wire itself, pi times capital R squared. Once again, current per area, cross-sectional area perpendicular to the wire. However, when you're inside, then on the right-hand side of the expression, I'm about to write in the denominator of the expression, we're going to have the area right here of this circle that is formed by my Ampereian path, because we have the I enclosed like so within that Ampereian path. So then therefore, the same current density J is going to be the I enclosed that we're looking for divided by pi times little r squared like so. And now with just this portion of the expression here, we then just solve for I enclosed. So the pi's cancel out like so, and then cross multiply the little r squared here up to the numerator on the other side of the expression. So I enclosed, and then therefore ends up being this expression here. That then goes here on the right-hand side of my Ampere's law expression. So mu naught times I little r squared over capital R squared. And then a little bit of cancellation occurs here in this situation. 
one of the little r's cancels out like so, and then divide the two pi to the denominator on the other side of the expression. Like this. Let me make this a little bit more distinct. Like so. Okay, now the two magnetic field calculations that we've performed here, they should match up with each other at the surface of the wire. So what happens when R is equal to capital R? Well, on the top board, when R is equal to capital R, the magnitude of the magnetic field ends up being this quantity here. Okay, what about on the bottom board? Well, here on the bottom board, if you set little r equal to capital R, obviously you get the exact same result like so. This is like matching up the electric field magnitude calculations at like the surface, for example, of a distribution of charge when we did a spherical charge distribution problem back in chapter 22, same idea. You do have to be familiar with the graph associated with the magnetic field in this situation. A graph of the magnetic field as a function of little r, it looks like this. Okay, so on this graph, let's say that right here is the radius of the wire, capital R. So then therefore, what does the magnetic field look like for small r less than capital R? Well, right here, you notice it increases linearly, like so. And it does so to this point right here at the surface of the, uh, the wire. When we do get to the surface of the wire, the magnitude of the magnetic field is this quantity here. Like so. Okay, and then when R is greater than capital R, our magnetic field then drops off as a one over R relationship. Like so. You should recognize that graph. It looks very similar to the graphs that we looked at in some problems back in chapter 22 for Gauss's law when graphing out the electric field magnitude as a function of small r, okay? Okay, go ahead and pause here if you wish and then copy down the next problem I have to erase and so forth. Okay, next we look at the coaxial cable. A nice example of a coaxial cable would be like the colored component cables that you see in various stereo theater equipment, game equipment, and so on and so forth. Okay, ultimately coaxial cables are kind of like the ancestors of today's more modern HDMI cables. All right, at any rate, however, the problem is as follows. So a coaxial cable carries a current I in both the inner and outer conductors, but in opposite directions. The currents are uniformly distributed on the respective surfaces, and the radii of the surfaces are A and B. Okay, that then looks like this. Okay, so right here is a cylindrical shell. This is empty space, and this right here is a thin piece of metal. Okay, here is another cylindrical shell, like so. This is a thin piece of metal, and this right here is empty space. And then cylindrically, they both go off in directions like so. So if you wish, go ahead and pause at this moment, and if you have component cables associated with stereo equipment or game equipment or something like that, go ahead and unplug one for a moment and take a look at the socket. When you look at the socket, it's basically gonna look like this. Okay, now this cylindrical shell here has a radius small a. This cylindrical shell has a radius small b. And then the currents are distributed in the following way. They're on the surfaces of these cylindrical shells. We'll have a current I flowing in this direction like so. This is like coming from the socket to your game console or whatever. And then ultimately the current flows out of your game console back into the socket. It does so here along the outer shell like so. So you basically have current coming in like this and then ultimately it goes back out like so. 
So it comes into whatever you have it hooked up to, a game console, for example, and then it goes back out like that. That's the basic idea behind a coaxial cable. Okay, okay let me read the remainder of the problem here. Okay, so using Ampere's law, what we now have to do is we have to find the magnetic field everywhere. All right, in order to do so, let's basically start here from the inside and then work our way out. So let's set up the radius of our circular Ampere path here. First of all, less than A, where A, once again, is the radius of this inner cylindrical shell. Keep in mind that this right here is empty space, so there's no I enclosed, so then therefore immediately the V field is equal to zero. Okay, now let's take a look and see what happens between A and B. Okay, so between A and B, then we'll set up a circular Ampere path like so. So we have our I, our current pointing out of the page like this. Therefore, you end up with a magnetic field that circulates on the diagram in the space between A and B, and it does so counterclockwise. So right here is our B field like so. And then the magnitude of that B field, as we've already seen in numerous calculations thus far, is just nothing more than this. So, so we end up with a magnetic field here inside. Okay, what about outside when R is greater than little b? Well, notice that the two currents I here are pointing in opposite directions. Think of this one as a positive number, and this one here in the opposite direction, and therefore as a negative number. So then therefore the I enclosed is equal to zero, and then therefore the B field outside is equal to zero. So I enclosed is equal to I minus I is equal to zero. So you end up with no magnetic field outside of the wire. All of your magnetic field is here. This is the advantage to setting up circuits in situations where you don't want magnetic fields present, which we can then affect other elements within the circuit. So then therefore we set up a coaxial situation for that reason. The coaxial situation basically confines the magnetic field here in between the two conducting cylindrical shells of radius A and radius B. There's no magnetic field out here to affect anything else associated with your circuit, and there's no magnetic field in there. Easy enough, okay? Okay, go ahead and pause here and then take a look at the next problem. And the next problem is extremely important. It's what's referred to as the infinite sheet. And then the infinite sheet will eventually lead to an understanding as to, as to how this basic circuit element called a solenoid works. We'll get to this, however, a little bit later. Let's just take a look at the infinite sheet calculation itself. Okay, so what does an infinite sheet of current look like? And it says that it has negligible thickness and then small n turns per unit length, find the magnetic field everywhere. Okay, well think of an infinite sheet of current as basically a plane of current where all the current flows in one direction, say out of the board at us like this. This is analogous to calculating the gravitational field due to an infinite sheet which would be analogous to the surface of the Earth. And if you recall from Gauss's law, that's a constant gravity field. And then also in the context of Gauss's law, when we looked at an infinite sheet of charge, you ended up with a constant electric field. Same thing here. You have an infinite sheet of current, so then therefore you should end up with a constant magnetic field. You know, here's the basic drawing, however, of the situation to get us started. I'm going to think of my infinite sheet of current here is divided up into the following. Basically individual wires, if you will, that are all crammed together. And each one of these wires, like so, is carrying a current I that is coming out of the page. And then we also have here what is referred to as small n. This is the number of turns per unit length. The length, by the way, is in this direction.
Okay, now overall, what is the magnetic field going to look like here? Intuitively, it should be a constant, okay, based upon what I've described earlier for a constant gravity field and a constant electric field. But how do we end up with a rough idea of the direction and how to actually make the calculation? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these wires and pull them apart from each other a little bit such that there is some space in between them. And then we'll see what happens when we look at the individual magnetic fields associated with these wires. Okay, so here's one wire like so. Here's another wire like so. Here's another wire like so, and so on. Each one of these wires here carries a current I. Okay, what does the magnetic field look like associated with each? Well, each individual wire is going to have a circular magnetic field that is basically going to rotate clockwise here around each cylindrical wire. So, for example, for this guy right here, if the current is coming out of the page, we end up with a B field that circulates like this. Like so. Okay, now watch what happens for this guy right here. This guy right here also has a current pointing like this, and then therefore its magnetic field circulates like so. Here, 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 and here. Notice what's happening right here. Notice that the two magnetic field lines are pointing in opposite directions. And if these currents are all identical, and the radii of these blue circles are identical, so the magnitude of the magnetic fields are the same. Because those magnetic fields are pointing in opposite directions, they then cancel each other out. Same thing will happen here, same thing will happen here, and so on and so on. So then what is left over? Well, take a look now above the sheet. You end up with magnetic field lines here that are pointing to the left-hand side on the diagram. Take a look down here. You end up with magnetic field lines that are pointing on the right-hand side of the diagram. So then therefore, if you take these black cylindrical wires and then cram them all together, you then end up with a constant magnetic field where below the sheet, all the magnetic field lines point to the right and they're parallel to the sheet. And then above the sheet, all the magnetic field lines point to the left. Once again, they're all constant and they are parallel to the sheet itself. So you end up then with a magnetic field, a net magnetic field that looks like this. Okay, so right here, once again, are all my wires, if you will, all crammed together now. Current coming out of the page like so. Okay, and then above the sheet, all the B field lines then point to the left. So, and then below the sheet, all the magnetic field lines point to the right. Like so. So that's how we first of all understand the shape of the magnetic field here associated with the infinite sheet. Okay, next we have to set up our Ampere's law calculation in order to find the magnitude of that magnetic field. And as I indicated earlier, it should be a constant. Hang on a second, I need coffee. Okay, so here's then how we set up our Ampere's law calculation. Okay, this is your first example where on the left-hand side of the expression, when setting up this line integral, we do not set up a circular path. Instead, what we do is we set up a rectangle that looks like this. like so, where what I'm going to do is circulate on the rectangle here counterclockwise. I'm going to go this direction, this direction, this direction, and this direction. Okay, take a look at this leg of the path here and this leg of the path here. Right here, the DL vector, if you will, like so, is perpendicular to the B field vector. This is a dot product, keep that in mind. So then therefore, if these two vectors are perpendicular to each other, cosine of 90 degrees is equal to zero. 
So that path integral then therefore is equal to zero here, and it's also equal to zero here for the exact same reason. So then therefore when I do add up this integral on the left hand side, it's only this portion of the path here and this portion of the path here that I have to worry about. Let's say that each side of the rectangle here is equal to L. So then therefore this path integral right here is BL, this path integral right here is BL. So there are two of them, like so. And then on the right-hand side of the expression, we have our constant mu naught and then the I enclosed. Okay, the I enclosed is just right here within the rectangle. It's some number of terms that are contained within that rectangle, capital N, and then multiplied by the current I associated with each. That's the I enclosed. Like so. Once again, capital N is the number of turns, the number of wires, if you will, that are contained within this rectangle. Okay, let's go ahead and divide the 2L to the other side. Like so. And then right here, capital N over L is little n, the number of turns per unit length. And we end up with this right here, which is a constant magnetic field. Okay, so for this constant magnetic field, then, it's dependent upon the number of turns per unit length specifically. So, in other words, the more wires that you cram together as closely spaced as possible, like so, with a solenoid, this then increases the magnitude of the magnetic field. Okay, how do we then picture exactly what the solenoid's magnetic field then therefore looks like? Well, what we do is we basically add up the magnetic fields associated with two infinite sheets. One sheet, however, has the current coming out at us like so, like the calculation that I just did. And then the other sheet here at the top has the current moving in this direction like so. That then looks like this. So before we specifically get to the solenoid itself, let's take a look at two infinite sheets where the currents point in opposite directions. So first of all, I got what I drew earlier. Like so. Okay, and then in blue, this guy's magnetic field, I'll draw a couple of field lines, looks like this. So. Okay, now let's have another infinite sheet that's parallel to this one, but it points into the board. I'm going to go ahead and put it here. Like so. So all those currents point into the board. Okay, ignore the blue vectors for just a moment. In which directions does this guy's magnetic field point? Take the thumb on your right hand pointed in the direction of the current into the board. Above the sheet, it points to the right. Like so. Okay, what about below the sheet? Below the sheet, it points to the left. Like so. Notice what happens to the various magnetic field lines. Above both of them, up here, blue to the left cancels out with red to the right. You end up with no magnetic field here. And then therefore, down below both of the sheets, we have blue to the right canceling out with red to the left. No net magnetic field down here. Instead, you end up with a net magnetic field here in between the two sheets, then in this case points to the right hand side. So take the previous value that I wrote down and just multiply it by two. That then gives us this. Like so. What I actually did for us is the last example in the lecture examples for today. Go ahead and pause the film here at this point and copy down that example.
Okay, so what we have here in the last example, essentially this problem that I just did is referred to as the, in, uh, the ideal solenoid. Okay, an ideal solenoid basically is a cylindrical wire that is wrapped upon itself like so. There's just a single wire here, by the way. The end of one, one end of the wire is over here, the other end of the wire is over here, and it's all just looped around like so, and all the loops that are crammed as closely spaced as possible together to increase the value of small n, making it as big as possible. And then we can picture, for example, the top of the solenoid as the infinite sheet that's going like that, and the bottom of the solenoid is the infinite sheet that is going like that. This then creates this net magnetic field that is basically confined here to the tunnel itself. So you end up then therefore with a strong magnetic field within the tunnel. There is no magnetic field up here, there's no magnetic field down here, because it ends up going off into infinity like so in both directions. That's what's meant by the ideal solenoid. Okay, That is the answer for the problem. However, of course, this is not an ideal solenoid, it's finite in length, so then therefore what does the magnetic field look like due to a finite solenoid? Looks like this. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and draw a solenoid now, like so as this coil of wire, and then as I indicated earlier, you end up with this really strong magnetic field that is inside the tunnel, if you will, where the magnitude of that magnetic field is this quantity here that we just found a few moments ago. All right, then, uh, however, outside of the coil, then you end up with a magnetic field that looks like this. Okay, let's see if I can draw this carefully enough. Cleaning out my diagram here a little bit. I'm trying to draw this, it says that my magnetic field here is tightly confined to the tunnel itself. So notice how closely spaced together the magnetic field lines here are inside of the tunnel. And by the way, let me just go ahead and point the magnetic field like so. So you end up with these tightly spaced magnetic field lines here inside the tunnel, and then therefore you end up with a strong magnetic field outside the tunnel. However, notice that the magnetic field lines are far apart from each other. They are quite weak. This is the basic design behind what is referred to as an electromagnet. An electromagnet provides for us a nice means of converting electric potential energy associated with an electrical current into some form of potential energy. In this case, watch this, gravitational potential energy. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and set up a simple demo here, so bear with me as I do. So I've got my potential difference here. Let me go ahead and hook it up to the solenoid here. Like so, and then let me grab a paper clip. And, uh, should have done this earlier. Once again, bear with me here. There we go. All right, so here's an ordinary paper clip. Let me go ahead and turn this on. And when I do, I'm going to give this a fair amount of current. There we go, like so. And then outside of the solenoid, basically out here, the magnetic field is quite weak. So then therefore the solenoid is not able to pick up the paperclip, for example. The paperclip, by the way, is iron. It's slightly magnetic itself. However, let me go ahead now and put the paperclip here inside the tunnel. And lo and behold, it then gets attracted by the electromagnet. So what I've done here is I've converted then 
potential energy associated with an electrical current ultimately into now in this case gravitational potential energy because I'm holding the paper clip here above the solenoid. Now I'll go ahead and turn off the current and the paper clip falls like so. Okay, now tip this diagram on its side. If you tip this diagram on its side, notice what it looks like. It's a dipole magnetic field going all the way back to the beginning of chapter 27. field. Remember that the Earth has a dipole magnetic field shape associated with it. We now understand where that magnetic field shape comes from. Here's where it comes from. All right, so right here, We'll say is the Earth, here's the Earth's equator, north and south poles geographically. And then we end up with a dipole magnetic field where the poles of the magnetic field are slightly offset from the geographic poles. This is called magnetic variation, by the way, in geophysics. So ultimately what causes this dipole magnetic field shape to basically be identical to that of the solenoid. In other words, what is the solenoid in this case? What is the flow, if you will, of electrical current? The flow of electrical current occurs in the outer core of the Earth. This is how we know that the outer core is a liquid. The reason why we do know it's a liquid is because the molten metallic material within the iron core, the outer core, as it circulates, generates the magnetic field associated with a solenoid. So the solenoid, if you will, that's buried within the earth is the iron core itself, is the outer core of the earth itself. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause here. This concludes today's lectures. Today's shirt is abysmal dawn. Take care, everyone.